Thank you everybody so much for being here um, at this event that we are calling You Are Essential. We are so excited to have everybody. Um, this is a event that we have put together. I, my name, first of all, my name is Nate Garcia. I'm the Chief of Staff at Center for Employment Opportunities, uh, known as CEO to some folks. Um, just wanna give a huge thank you to the CUNY um, School of Public Health and the New York uh, Vaccine Literacy Campaign for hosting this event with us um, and for our incredible speakers who I can't wait to introduce. Um, but a few kind of just bits about this event and about who is putting this event on. The NY Vaccine Literacy Campaign is an initiative of the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and P Health Policy. Everyone's gonna have to bear with me. I hope that I don't mess any of these things up. Its mission is to lighten the load of community organizations in New York City, Long Island, Rockland, and Westchester counties by increasing access to vaccine education. To connect with the campaign for resources, this is important, um, resources, education, technical support, you can reach out to Hannah Stewart Lathan, uh, program manager of the campaign who's on this call. Um, and she, you, you can just put your email in the chat and they'll follow up with a link um, to the newsletter and some other resources. Um, and then also just wanna give a huge thank you to Ryan Health, the Interfaith Public Health Network and the CUNY SPH Harlem Health Initiative for your support. Um, okay, so we have some incredible experts here today to talk about the COVID vaccines. Um, I know that it's been so long, it feels like ages that we've been talking about the COVID vaccines, but I'm really, really ecstatic about the fact that we have, you know, some pretty heavy hitters here to talk about, pretty much cover all the bases in terms of, of questions that anyone could have about the COVID vaccines. You know, we're going to get into some of the science, but also some of the real world things uh, that anyone may be thinking about when deciding to get the vaccine. So um, I'm going to start by introducing um, oh, and, and I'll, I'll say one more thing before the agenda, the agenda was up in a second. We're going we're gonna to go through a couple of presentations. We're going to hear from a few CEO staff members who are going to give some testimonials, and then we're going to do audience Q&A. And so if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat, and we'll make sure that they get answered at the end. Anna, did I miss anything? All right, no. I'll take that as we're good. Okay, um, so I'm so excited to introduce Dr. Dial Hewlett Jr., who is a medical director of the Division of Disease Control of the Westchester County Department of Health and a member of the COVID-19 Task Force of the National Medical Association. You can read uh, Dr. Hewlett's full bio on the screen, but Dr. Hewlett, take it away. So happy to have you here. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Garcia. And uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here uh, to uh, discuss this important topic with all of you. And I hope that this can be a nice interactive kind of a session. Hopefully we'll be able to provide you with some information that will be helpful to you about COVID and about the, uh, the vaccine. And so I'm going to uh, share my screen. I have a few slides uh, to show and uh, we'll be on our way here. Get the view here. Okay, I think we're there. Okay, so this is for our, our program here. I'm going to go through some of the science with you. And then uh, Dr. Fulalove is going to go through some of the other important elements uh, around uh, COVID and the, uh, and the vaccines. But I'm gonna to try to stick in my lane as a medical person. Now, where would we be without vaccines? Uh, this uh, slide actually shows Dr. Edward Jenner who was the person who was credited with inventing the smallpox vaccine. Uh, Dr. Jenner found or discovered or noted that individuals who were involved with milking cows, uh, they were called the milkmaids in those days in the 1700s, that for some reason they didn't develop smallpox. And he noted that there were these sores that would develop on the hands of the milkmaids and what he actually did was he took some material from these sores and he turned it into a vaccine. And this was believed to be the first vaccine known as the smallpox vaccine. And as a result of this, this discovery, uh, Dr. Jenner probably saved uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives as a result of this. Okay. Now, these are some of the common vaccine preventable diseases. 
uh, diseases like polio, which most of you have probably never seen, uh, but whooping cough, measles, mumps, all of these diseases can be easily prevented uh, by vaccines. And even in recent days, we're going back to the 1700s with Dr. Jenner, but even during uh, my lifetime, when I was doing my training at the hospital, the um, uh, Jacoby Hospital here in, in the Bronx, New York, we would see children who had meningitis due to Haemophilus influenza B and pneumococcal disease. And now we don't see that. And that's because we have vaccines. Some of these children would have meningitis and this could be debilitating to them throughout their lives. So these are all vaccine preventable diseases. And currently uh, what, what happens when we stop vaccinating is that we start to see all of these diseases all over again. And in recent years, we've seen outbreaks of the measles here in the New York area, out in California. I know we have some guests that are on the, on the call here from uh, California. In California, there were outbreaks of the whooping cough and there were actually infants who died. And we've had outbreaks of the mumps as well here in New York and elsewhere. Now, currently, there are three different types of COVID vaccines that are available to us that have been approved here in the United States, either on full approval or on emergency use authorization. We have the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer BioNTech vaccines, both of which are mRNA vaccines. And we have the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen vaccine, which is what we call a viral vector vaccine. All of these vaccines are very effective. In fact, they are probably about 90% effective in preventing serious illness, in preventing hospitalization, and in preventing death. And all three of these vaccines have been extremely safe. There have been millions of people who have been vaccinated very safely here in the United States and in other parts of the world. Now you've heard a lot about herd immunity, and I thought that some people would enjoy actually understanding where this actually comes from and how does this actually tie in with vaccines and why is this important? There's a lot of talk about being our brother's keeper. And this is actually the theme of uh, this whole issue as far as herd immunity, because if we are vaccinated, we actually are not only protecting ourselves, but we are protecting those around us. And herd immunity, is also known as, let's see if I can get rid of this here. Herd immunity is also known as, uh, through the R naught as we call it, the R naught represents what we call a basic reproductive number. Uh, and it's for communicable infectious diseases. And we apply it to diseases like COVID, but long before COVID was around, uh, this R naught was applied to other communicable diseases like the measles and the mumps and influenza. The R naught represents the average number of people that an infected person is likely to infect. So at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, back in March of last year, the R naught was estimated to be two. That is for every infected person, they would on average pass infection on to two others and the infection would grow rather wildly. Influenza has an R naught of about two, and the measles has an R naught of 12. That is for every person that is infected with the measles, they will pass it on to 12 others. And you might say to me, well, why is it that we don't see everybody getting the measles? Well, the reason why is because just about everyone is vaccinated for the measles or they are immune to the measles because they are old enough to have been around uh, to have ha actually had the measles. Now, these calculations are based on an assumption that all in a population are susceptible. And this data is based on uh, uh, a publication from Dr. Freiberger uh, that appeared in April of uh, 2020. Now, what can we say here about the Delta variant? And you've heard a lot about the Delta variant and why are we making such a big deal about this uh, Delta variant? Well, the reason why, and let's see if I can move this, this uh, out of the way here. Okay, here it is. The reason why we're making a big deal about it is because for every um, person 
who was infected, as we said before with COVID, they will go on to infect about two others. Now for the Delta variant, one person will go on to infect probably five others. So the Delta variant is more than twice as transmissible as what we call the wild strain or the original strain. And the R naught for the Delta variant is believed to be about, about five. And so uh, the R naught increases the percentage of the population that is required in order for us to achieve herd immunity. You may recall that at the beginning of the pandemic, when we started to get a hold of a vaccine and when the vaccine this vaccination was started, it was said that we may be able to reach herd, achieve a herd immunity by 60%. And now it is probably up around 90%. And that's why there's a difference. And this is one of the things that actually shows this very interesting uh, when we have the first generation here, second generation, third generation, and fourth generation. The first generation leads to two new infections, second generation to four, third generation to eight, and the fourth generation to 16. The R0, uh, if, if, it's, if it's approximately 2.5, a vaccination rate of 60% would be required to achieve herd immunity. And that's where we were last year. And now we are at probably five. And so if we look at the R naught, uh, if the R naught is two, there would, be, uh, there would be two to the N infections in the nth round. And if an infected person remained capable of transmitting infection for a week, this is an assumption, then we could assume that all of the persons, and if we assume that all the persons in the world are susceptible, the entire world's population of 7.8 billion would be infected after 32 weeks. This is what actually could happen. And this is one of the things we were worried about might happen with COVID. Now, un unvaccinated persons will say to us, you know what, I'll wait and see. I'll wait and see what happens. And here is what happens when we fail to reach herd immunity as we did earlier this summer. Have we seen enough yet? We saw Mississippi hospital systems, uh, it was felt, felt they may collapse. And this was in August. Uh, hospitals in Texas were out of ICU beds. Hospitals were overwhelmed in various parts of the South and the West. In Missouri, the hospitals were turning some COVID cases away. And now I think that we realize that children are starting to make, make up a major proportion of the individuals who are getting sick and who are being hospitalized. Over 4.4 million children have tested positive for COVID since the beginning of the pandemic. And over 121,000 new cases were added during uh, one week of mid in the middle of August. So the question is, have we seen enough? We are gonna wait and see. Well, have we seen enough yet? And so the summary for my talk is, is the following. When you accept vaccination uh, against a communicable disease like COVID, it protects you and it protects you, those around you in the herd, including children who cannot yet be vaccinated uh, and also it, it will help to protect those with weakened immune systems who, even though they get the vaccine, they don't have the same robust response that a normal person has. And they may remain, they may remain uh, susceptible uh, to the infection. When a level of herd immunity is reached, the virus will have few susceptible hosts and the pandemic comes under control. When the vaccination rate remains low, the virus has the opportunity to do all of the following things. It can adapt through mutations like the Delta variant, and that's what happened. It can become more easily transmitted, and that's what happened. With rates of infection increasing logarithmically, that is what has happened. And you can have overwhelming of the health system as we have in various parts of the United States, in the Western states, and in some of the Southern states where the vaccine rates are low. And that's exactly what has happened. And so I'll close and I will turn uh, the meeting back over uh, to uh, Mr. Garcia uh, so that he can, he can move on to the next part of our program. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hewlett. That was actually so incredible. I, you know, math and science were never my strong suit in school. And I just, the way that you explained all of that, and I'm sure there are lots of questions that could be asked, but, um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm really appreciate just having that framework about the facts and, and about herd immunity. I think I feel like I learned a lot. 
Um, all right, yeah, I, I imagine there might be some questions that come up from Dr. Hewlett's presentation, so we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, but I wanna turn it over uh, to Dr. Fullalove. Um, yeah, start whenever you'd like. Oh, good evening, everybody. Really glad to have an opportunity to speak. I think when we decided that this would be a really important presentation to make, I thought that the most important contribution I could provide would be to deal specifically with the doubts that a lot of people have about why I should do this. I'm a professor of public health, and the standard argument we make in public health is you need to do this for your family, for your community, for your neighbors, for everybody. In the United States, a lot of what we do is based on what's in it for me. You're asking me to engage in something that involves a personal level of risk. I'm not sure when you talk about me that this is something that I wanna do. I've heard people tell me, look, there are what, 700,000 deaths that are associated with COVID-19 in the United States? Doc, there are 330 million people in the United States. That's a scary number, but you're not telling me that everybody has got it, that everybody is gonna get it. And it seems to me that if I'm lucky, we're really talking about a very small portion of the US population. What are the odds that it's actually gonna happen to me? Isn't it true that if I'm reasonably healthy, there's a good chance that if I do get COVID-19, it'll feel like a cold. I might be uncomfortable, but I've lived long enough to have colds. I understand what that's like. I can deal with that. But you're gonna ask somebody to stick a needle in my arm. And I haven't had a needle in my arm since I was a kid. Not only does it hurt, I don't know what's in it. They certainly developed it really quickly. Is it really the case that this is what I gotta do to keep me safe? Seems to me that if I'm lucky, the odds that it'll happen to me are really small. And if it does happen to me, if I do become infected, the chances that I'll be hospitalized or that I'll die are actually probably pretty small. So a couple of things I think have to be said. Number one, there is one thing that's correct. There is no medical or public health intervention that is completely without risk. Everything that we do in life, everything that we do from getting into an automobile to even riding up and down in an elevator, carries some risk with it. Automobiles do crash. Elevators do fall. And I think the idea that I'm not sure what risk I'm taking here is something that I understand. Personally, I'm scared to death of risk. But the likelihood that the public health service or the medical profession can absolutely guarantee that nothing will happen to you as a result of taking this vaccine just isn't true. What I think it is important to point out is that the risk that comes from getting vaccinated is very, very small. People hear about breakthrough infections. Let's be clear, we've got tens of million people worldwide who've been infected with COVID-19. We have multiple million people who have had vaccines. We're not looking at large scale deaths as a result of having a vaccine. Yes, there are breakthrough infections, but what we know is that it's very rare for somebody with a breakthrough infection, something that happens after you've gotten vaccinated, it's very rare for those folks to be hospitalized and it's even rarer for them to die. So since we're talking about risk, isn't it the case that the risk of being hospitalized and dying is so much greater, especially in the black community if you're infected, when the likelihood that with a vaccination, your risk of having a side effect is gonna be very small should tell you that if you're doing a risk benefit calculation, What's in it for me? What's the risk? What's the benefit? The benefit is not only are you not likely to have any severe reactions, it's also the case that what will happen is that your family, your friends, your neighbors, all the folk you work with will be protected. Second thing, it I know isn't apparent, but I've been around for a while. I'm 77 years old. I just had my third booster shot with Pfizer on Saturday. I think I look pretty good. And I think it's really the case that because I'm somebody who is hypertensive, I have had a history of congestive heart failure with open heart surgery. I'm the kind of person that really has to take care because most of the mortality, most of the deaths from COVID-19 have been in folks my age, black folks my age. 
And because we've lost so many seniors in the Black and Latin community, because we've lost some of the leadership that comes from all that we depend on with respect to our grandparents and the aged to provide us, for those of us who are my age and who still remain, let me ask, do it as a favor for me. And for all the other aged folk in your community, in your family, in everything that you are about, because if you are not sure about its benefit for you, maybe its benefit for everybody else is something that will be convincing and something that will give you a sense that this is what we ought to be about. I think it's also the case that uh, a lot of folks are very concerned about why at this point in the pandemic, one should pay attention to the things that public health has been telling us. I know, since I'm talking to you from New York City, that in the very beginning of the pandemic, it was very evident that communities of color were harder hit than most communities by this pandemic. What happened in many communities was tragic. Public health and medical services were very slow to test the neighborhoods that were at greatest risk for being infected. They were very slow to get tested and when vaccines rolled out, in some communities, the folk who should have been first came in way behind. So because there's a great deal of mistrust in our community of people who have anything to do with medicine and anything to do with research, there is a sense that in many instances in my community, folks said, look, if they did such a bad job of managing this pandemic in the beginning, now that they've got a vaccine, why should I trust what they say right now? A lot of people make a great deal of medical science research and the damage that it has done to the black community. Folk who know history can say, hey, it goes way beyond Tuskegee. If you look at the history of slavery, and if you look at the manner in which medical science treated slaves in the United States, it becomes very clear that we were never treated as human beings, we were clinical material. I believe in the existence of racial memory. I believe that a lot of us carry with us a kind of a, ooh, I gotta be safe, I gotta be cautious, I gotta be wary of what people in science are telling me I ought to do. And I'm very aware of the fact that some of what we're dealing with isn't the kind of thing that can be uh, cleared up or reasoned away with scientific arguments. What people want is not science or numbers. What they want is the belief that they can trust people like us, like Dial and me, that when we say it's in the best interest of the community, you should follow our lead. You should agree with us that this is what we do to protect ourselves. Maybe the best way to understand this, and I'll end with this, is that I started doing public health research in 1986. I started with HIV AIDS. That was the second viral pandemic of the 20th century. I remember in the 1980s, everybody thought that maybe HIV was a conspiracy. Maybe it was really man-made and put on the planet to get rid of undesirables. People of color, gay folk, folk who injected and shared intravenous drugs and drug equipment. There was a sense in which there was such mistrust and such belief that conspiracy theories made sense that it was often very hard when we actually had effective treatments for HIV to get folk to agree that maybe it's a good idea to get tested. And if I'm HIV infected, maybe it's really important for me to get into treatment. I've been very sensitive to the role that conspiracy theories play in our community. But here's what I think is the greatest conspiracy that is operating against us. It's simply this, we have something that works. We have something that can preserve life and keep people healthy. We have something that can save some of the deaths, some of the mortality that we've already suffered thus far. But the greatest conspiracy is to sow the doubt in the community so that folk who should take it, folk who are at risk, folk who might die as a result of not getting a vaccine won't take it because the conspiracy theories tell them I'm more credible, I'm more easily believed than somebody from the CDC, somebody who's a physician, somebody who says he's a public health science. The real conspiracy then would be in the face of something that works, we would not take it because we simply don't believe that it's in our best interest. This entire webinar is all about what do we got to do 
to make sure that we wipe away the doubts and we give people the sense that it is in the best interest of you as an individual and it's in the best interest of our community to make sure that whatever else we do, if we have something that works, that can preserve life, that can promote health and prevent disease, we should be all about that. We should embrace it. We should take it because in the end, if not us, who? And if not now, when? How about I stop there? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bolove. Um, I'm feeling a little inspired after you're talking, so thank you so much for sharing all of that. And um, I especially liked what you said just around, you know, it's, it's actually at a certain point, not about the facts, it's about how all of us feel. And so I hope that we can create some space here um, we're going to hear from from uh, we're going to hear some testimonials from some folks who they themselves you know weren't sure about the decision to get vaccinated and kind of, they're going to talk about their process. But we do you know there's lots of questions I'm sure that that both of the presentations brought forth. So please throw them in the chat. We have one already. Um, we will definitely get your question answered if you got it. So um, I'm going to turn it over to someone who's very special to me, Miss Hilma Delon Adab. Um, from our New York City office. And Hilma, I would just love for you to talk about your process uh, deciding to get vaccinated. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ms. Hilma Dilonea Dab, and um, I work at the New York City office, 50 Broadway. And um, I've been with the company, I'm gonna make 32 years this coming October. <laughs> so I'm very proud of that. And it took me a while to decide whether I should take the uh, vaccine or not, because I truly am a conspiracy theorist couch potato. <laughs> I, I, when I discussed this with Nate, I, I explained everything to him, how I felt. And in the beginning, it was scary because you were hearing so many different uh, they were talking so many ideas and saying so many things in the, in the media platform about they took the vaccine and this happened and that happened and somebody died afterward and so many things going on. So that was like just shrinking me more and more and more not to, you know, I was more, I was getting more afraid of it every time I heard a negative thing about it. And um, it took me a, a long time. Um, in my head, I was thinking, oh my God, maybe this is the way that the government is gonna control us by uh, putting that chip in that they're talking about to control us. I mean, a lot of crazy things in my head were going on. And um, I just waited, you know, like most of the other people and I waited and waited um, for months. And then um, one day my mom, who's 83 years old, she called me and she said, um, I'm thinking of getting the vaccine. And I said, mom, are you sure? Because you know, you're 83 and you're a cancer survivor. You, you have uh, uh, osteosclerosis and um, you, know, you have diabetes. And you know, I was kind of scared for her because of her health condition. And she said, child, I've lived 83 years of my life. Whatever happens, happens. I'd rather be safe than sorry because if I do get it, then I know I'm really gonna die, you know? So I said, okay, mom, it's your decision, but um, just let me know, okay? And then um, she went ahead and she did it. And let me tell you, this woman did not even, no side effect at all. She got the first shot and she did not get no side effect at all. And then on her second dose, the same thing. She did not get no, absolutely no side effect at all. But me, I was still skeptical because I was hearing those conspiracy theories and I kept hearing them, hearing them. And I, I backed away still. And then um, my husband decided to do it first. And I said, well, make sure that everything's in order, you know, so that way if something happens, make sure that your will is in order and everything. And he just said, oh, you're so awful. And we just laughed about it. But, um, you know, he did it first. And the only side effect he got was... Um, like um, more or less tiredness that he wanted to be uh, in bed for the whole day. Um, just a soreness in the arm, like, you know, every shot that you get, you do get sore, you know, but that's about it. On both occasions, the first and second. And um, that was it after that. And then I still waited a little bit more. And um, finally, after about two months after he did it, then I went ahead and I did it myself. 
I was still, mind you, I was still scared because I still had that in my head with the conspiracy theory. I still had that in my head. And when I, when I went to get it, I was nervous. My hands were sweating and everything. But I said, I have to do this because one thing is, if I do get the virus, I will not wind up with a tube down my throat. Absolutely. That was the only thing that I was thinking. I was, I was trying to avoid that. Whatever happens, happens, you know, and I did it. And the only side effect that I got the first day was the same thing, soreness on my arm and a little bit of like um, weakness, like you just want to stay in bed and so forth. So I did it on a weekend, on a Saturday, and I was back to work on Monday, both times. And to this day now, I feel perfectly fine, you know, and I don't regret it. I, I'm really glad that I did it because now I know that, you know, if, if we if I do get it, God forbid, if I do get it, I will be safe because I will not wind up in the hospital, you know? So that's my testimony. I'm glad that I did it. And I hope most of you will feel the same and get that fear out of your system because you're saving yourself and you're saving your family. You know, it's just, you need to do it. I mean, I consider this like um, those shots that were given like, the measles, the chicken pox, and all that in the past. And because we're in the 21st century, this is so new to us, you know? We, we, we never heard of that. Oh my God, that all humanity has to get vaccinated. But it's, it's basically the same thing because even though this virus is more stronger, of course, but it's basically the same thing. It's just a new, that's gonna be a new vaccine that's gonna be added to the immunization um, uh, passport that they, we, we used to get back in the days. It's the same thing. Just think about that. It'll be the same thing. Now, when children start going to school, they will have to have that passport saying mm -hmm. uh, they got the vaccine. So it's just the same thing, but it's just that it's new to us because so many years has passed and no one has seen this before. So I urge you, save, save, you know, save yourself by doing this and, and, and getting that vaccine. And I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hilma. Uh, just appreciate you so much for sharing yourself and your process. And um, <laughs> yeah, I think that that's really important. Um, all right, I'm gonna turn it over to our, our last testimonial before we get into Q and A's. Another person who I just think is the best from CEO, uh, Mr. Greg Martin, and uh, who is our senior site supervisor in Oklahoma City. Uh, Greg, are you there? I'm right here. How's everybody doing today? <laughs> Can y'all hear see me? You, Greg. Yep, Ryan can hear you loud and clear. Uh, uh, well, you know, Nate knows my situation and, and you know, my uh, inspiration. I never, like Nate, I never did not want the shot because I was in the process of trying to see my father because he was in the nursing home before he died. So when people were saying they weren't going to get the shot, I was like, where, where do I need to go? I mean, I drive it. You don't have to drive four hours. Okay, I drive four hours because... I was trying, I was, my time limit was short than everybody else and I had a different reason. So fear never came into my heart. I thought never about it. So, and I haven't regret getting the shot. I'm in line to get a booster shot uh, because, you know, uh, like my man said, it's just not about you, it's about protecting others and protecting your elder, elders. And if you want to be around people, this is what we're going to have to do. Super well said, Greg. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and you have been, you know, such a, a great advocate and, you know, spoken to so many people in our OKC office. And I just appreciate that a lot. All right. Um, we, we, we're officially at the Q&A portion. Um, we've got some kind of pre, like pre-written questions, but I would love to see more. If there are any in the audience, uh, you know, you can just write it in the chat and we'll make sure it gets answered. Um, Dr. Hugh and Dr. Fuller Love, the first one that came in is, does having a certain blood type help protect uh, someone from the vaccine? And, and clarifying that this isn't as a substitute for the vaccine, but just do we know of any impact of that on COVID? As, as far as we know, that does not really, the, the blood type that you have doesn't really protect you. There was some early data that suggested that there were fewer people proportionately uh, who had, I believe it was type O blood who uh, were getting the infection. But certainly there have been people with all blood types who have 
had the infection and who have uh, died as a result of the infection. And so uh, certainly there may be some variances, uh, but as far as we know, that does not protect you from uh, getting, the, uh, getting the infection. Let me just point out too that epidemiologists believe that there are a large portion of the American public. There's a large portion of the population worldwide that do have a natural immunity to COVID-19. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the Delta variant seems to show up for two months, kill a lot of people, and then suddenly fade away. And it fades away even though people who are not vaccinated have been exposed. But we don't know very much about natural immunity. We haven't been able to identify what causes it. As Dial pointed out, there was some early suspicion that it was tied to your blood type. But as far as we can see, there's really no way of knowing. So there's no test I can give you that'll tell you, oh, you don't need to be vaccinated because you have natural immunity. It might exist. I think the most important thing we tried to say here is don't bet on it. Uh, I am right around the corner from Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. You do not want to hear from people who are managing COVID-19 cases what it's like to watch people die from this infection. I tried to do my best to not scare people into saying, this is why you got to take it. But almost all the folk who work in the medical profession are exhausted by how much has to be done simply to care for somebody who is hospitalized and is really seriously ill. And because they know that they're working night and day to keep those people safe, the fact that so many of them are the ones who were not vaccinated has them throwing up their hands and almost weeping with the notion that whatever reasons people chose to not get vaccinated, now that you're in the bed and now that you're so sick, your family can't come see you, asking for a vaccine now before we say goodbye is just the classic case of too little too late. So yes, natural immunity might exist, but we don't know what has it, what it has as its consequences, what it, what it looks like. So the best bet is still the safest route is to get vaccinated. And I hope folks will uh, agree that this is a message that is really worth passing on to others. And I, I've heard also that uh, some people that have uh, con got contacted with the virus, some of them are thinking, oh, I don't need the shot because I got the virus already. I already have it in me, you know, and that's not true. They still need to get vaccinated. Because multiple infections with COVID-19 occur. You can get sick, get well, and then get infected again. And it does appear to be the case that if you have had antibodies to the virus and then we vaccinate you six months after that occurred, your protection seems to be a little bit stronger than it is amongst others. Dal, am I right about that? Yes, and I think as far as the vaccine is concerned, what you're, what you're saying, um, Ms. Dion, is actually correct. You get actually, if you get vaccinated, the, the antibody response that you get is probably about four times higher than what you would get with natural infection. And that means that it's going to last you for a much longer time as well. So uh, I think we, we encourage everyone uh, to get the vaccine, even people that have had the, uh, had the infection before. And as Bob is saying, uh, people that have had the infection before, they haven't met the Delta variant yet. And so the Delta variant can actually come in and do a lot of damage as well. We, what we know is that all of the currently available vaccines, including the J&J &J or Janssen, the uh -huh. Moderna, and the Pfizer vaccine, they all offer protection versus the Delta variant. Uh, the protection, the level of protection against the Delta variant may not be quite as high, but all of them seem to offer protection. One of the things that everybody is asking about now, and they're pointing the finger at uh, us and saying, well, you know, why are you telling us now that we need these boosters? Why is it that all of a sudden you're telling us that uh, some people need to have a third shot? And the reason is that as time goes on, there have been observations that have been made, and we have actually seen people who have uh, had what we call these breakthrough infections. And although some of the breakthrough infections have been mild, some of the people that get these infections can still transmit infection to other people who, if they get the infection, may not be as fortunate. And so the Centers for Disease Control and other experts have 
decided that the best way around this is to try to give third shots to people who are what we call immunocompromised and to look at people that are in the older age groups and people that are at a higher risk for being exposed, like those of us that work in healthcare, that we should actually be getting these boosters uh, as well. So it's a new situation. We're learning more about it. But as we can tell right now, the people that are in the hospital and the people that are sick are not the people that have been vaccinated. And it doesn't matter which vaccine you're talking about. We're not right. seeing a lot of people with, who got vaccinated with the J&J &J or with, with anything else. The people that are in the hospitals now, uh, I think the number was like around 98 or 99 percent are people that are totally unvaccinated. People do get sick, but one of the reasons we don't know how many people had breakthrough cases is that for many folks who've been vaccinated, they can't tell the difference between that and just having a cold. So we don't actually have accurate counts of the number of people who've been vaccinated who then subsequently get infected. And it's very much the case that they probably got infected by somebody who was also vaccinated. What's important, and we keep coming down to this one simple point, we're not saying you will never get infected. What we're right. saying is you won't get hospitalized and your chances of dying are even less. And, and let me just make one thing clear. I've been teaching public health courses in New York state prisons for 11 years. I teach public health courses as part of the Bard Prison Initiative. Every week since June, I have been in either Fishkill State Correctional Facility, for those of you who know New York, and right now I'm in Woodward. I'm in one of the places that you've described as being a place where a lot of people got sick and a lot of people died. Yes. I'm vaccinated. I have teaching, I've been teaching these courses every week. Move voila, here I am. So I'm very clear that because in some instances, the rate of vaccination in the joint is higher than it is in the community. Trust me when I say the brothers on the inside are very clear. Yeah, you don't want to take this risk. And the fact that all of them are safe and healthy and taking courses from me ought to be a testimony that maybe there's something in this. I'm speaking from the brothers who are behind bars who would tell you maybe there's something in this that you want to trust and you want to believe in. It is so important for us to have the individuals who are incarcerated uh, vaccinated because we all know that uh, communicable diseases and this COVID pandemic can be fueled by people who are incarcerated and then when they are released and they go home, they give it to their families because they got the infection while they were incarcerated. And so this is a very, very important thing for us. And this is one of the things that has been included in some of the, uh, of the grants that we're working on uh, at this very moment. And I think it's fair to say that one of the motivations for people who are incarcerated to get vaccinated is because maybe you've been reading that the cops, corrections officers, and firemen don't want to get vaccinated. So the brothers on the inside have gotten vaccinated because they're afraid they're going to get it from the staff. I mean, how's yeah. that? Yeah. I just think that that's one of the things that we have to consider. And those of you who've been following what's happening in New York City with Rikers Island know that we really are dealing with a problem there. And, and one of the reasons is where there is resistance, surprisingly, it's not just the folk who or on a webinar like this, it's the folk that we always thought of all, well, never mind. I don't want to get into that. I'm just saying that I've learned a lot about human behavior in the last year by just looking at who says yes and who says no. I continue yeah. to learn. I know there was a lot of um, emphasis at the beginning of the pandemic about surfaces, and we were really obsessed with making sure that we had clean surfaces. And what we've learned is that uh, transmission from surfaces is probably not really important. It's really more important when we talk about person-to-person -person transmission. Uh, I believe there is some data that is out there that shows that UV light probably does have an impact uh, on, uh, on, killing the, um, on killing the virus. But I think it's also important to add that basically people get infected because of the air. This is a virus that basically becomes like an aerosol spray. We call it an aerosolized virus. So your real risk is from being in a place where people are singing, shouting, crowded together, and over a 10, 15 minute period, they're breathing in enough airborne virus to create the infection. So for the most part, while we always think it's important for things like a cold and a flu 
to wash your hands and to be very careful about services. You, you should definitely continue to do mm -hmm. that. The real issue with COVID-19 is quite frankly, what happens when you're in a room with people who are not wearing a mask, where there's an infection and where a lot of breathing is going on, where you might get it that way. I, I do wanna say that because people have become hypersensitive to washing their hands and cleaning surfaces, We've had much less in the way of flu than we typically mm -hmm. get because people are wearing masks and all of a sudden they're protected against a variety of airborne and surface touch issues that can create a real problem for health. So those of us who are kind of clean freaks, I can't say that I'm one of them, are kind of happy that a lot of Americans have now become quite hysterical about washing their hands and da 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 Do keep that up. It's not just yes. for COVID-19. I think for your general health, that's a good idea. Yes, absolutely. Basically, I would say to get them involved in, um, hi, get them involved in um, probably like we're doing right now in videos, um, if, uh, uh, meetings, you know, um, to see if they can find some kind of videos that will talk about this from professional kind of platforms, you know, um, even if some of them might not speak English, you know, they can uh, they can just get them involved in hearing all those people and all those testimonies of how they felt before and how they feel now. So that that that, that you know, and basically they're scared. They're scared, you know. And to take that fear away, they need to absorb all the knowledge they can get. And if they can get them involved in going to communities, hearing people speak. Um, observing you know taking notes about what's what's happening and, and, and hearing what they have to say to open their mind more about this because this is serious this is this is something that is basically we're trying to save humanity here you know absolutely, absolutely. and um, i think getting, getting them involved instead of hearing it from the news or hearing it from facebook or whatever the case may be getting them involved in the community with other people that have taken that we're thinking the same way I was thinking and, and just getting them involved. Right, right. Get them involved so they right. could hear the, the testimonies and all that. That's what I would do. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Helma. I really appreciate it. We are at time. I just want to thank everyone for being here after hours and for your thoughtful questions, Dr. Hewlett, Dr. Full of Love. Just thank you. I, I, want, to, I want to make sure. Do you have any final thoughts you want to leave us with? I'm sure you probably have somewhere else important to be, but thank you again. I'll just say I want to thank the two our two friends who uh, offered those testimonies because I think at the end of the day, yes, you know, you can hear it from a doctor, yes, you can hear it from educators and other people, but I think it's very, very powerful to hear it from people who you trust uh, and the, the trusted messengers. Uh, and I, I'm sure that both of you are going to be uh, ambassadors uh, for the vaccine, and I think that's just so important. I couldn't agree more. I think people are tired of hearing the science. I think what resonates for a lot of people is telling people the story of the conflict, the struggle, and then the ultimate decision to say, yes, I'm gonna do this. I'm betting that numbers can't possibly do what Hilma, you did in describing what you had to go through in order to do this. And I would even organize a meeting where it's not the people in the science, it's folk like you. In a round table, we're really talking about, yeah, I had this, I yeah. had that, because I know people are going to identify with that, and their decision to take the vaccine might be hugely influenced by what you yeah. have. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, Thank absolutely. You. Show them the proof, you know? <laughs> You're the proof. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that is right. a perfect note to end on. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. We'll follow up with uh, other questions we didn't get to. Thank you, Dr. Hewlett, Dr. Bolo. Okay. Have Thank a great you, night, everyone. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.